Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck, part 3. Despite my own mistrust of Hitler, sharpened by the serial murders on and after 30th of June 1934, I had still welcomed the reintroduction of the Universal Military Service in March of 1935 and the remilitarization of the Rhineland a year later, although it grieved me to have to accept such gifts from Hitler of all people. Finally, in 1937 to 1938, after two more years in an atmosphere of increasing domestic violence, with the inevitability of the utter ruin of a Germany whose course was set by Hitler before my eyes, and in despairing certainty of being unable to change anything, anything at all, the only thing left for me was psychological flight into an inner emigration from my nation and a passive waiting until one day the regime's inevitable fall would enable Germany to back out of its dead end. Until then, I would hold out. Yet, I was not one of those sharp-sided intellectuals with high powers of discrimination. I had simply decided to use the common sense that nature had bestowed on me as far as it would go. And it had easily sufficed to see through the tricks that Hitler was playing. On September 1st, 1939, Hitler spoke to the Reichstag on his love of peace and endless forbearance and then said, Last night, for the first time, Poland fired on our own territory with regular troops. Since 05.45 hours, we have been firing back. And from now on, bombs will be answered with bombs. So he finally had it. Finally, his war. That was how I felt when I heard it over the radio. My God, how happy the man must be, released from the torment of the long wait for his war. And two pictures published shortly thereafter in the German press have haunted me ever since and will continue to haunt me throughout my life. The first... German troops forcibly opening a Polish border barricade, unsuspectingly throwing open the door to the destruction of the Reich. The other? Hitler observing through a telescope the burning of Warsaw, the result of the destruction which he now served to the east and whose later return from there to Germany, with interest and compound interest, was to push him into shabby suicide, his stealing away from responsibility, a desperado's exit worthy of his desperado deeds. What a world of difference between him and the statesman after whom he had dared to name a great warship so as to create a quasi-personal connection with him. And now war was on the march, the war of an impatient Hitler who had managed to have his people, a people certainly not without living space, but without patience, swear unconditional allegiance to him. Soon the name Great German Freedom Fight was given to this war. My God, what business did the idea of freedom have anywhere near Hitler? as the goal of a regime which since 1933 had publicly made itself manifest through murder, terror and repression. What else could Hitler want than to continue these horrors inside Germany and expand them outwards as far as the military conquests of the Wehrmacht would enable him to do so? No, Herr Hitler had no message of freedom, no real message at all, no progressive goal for mankind, he who embodied a historical low on public morality. Everywhere I saw his cherished motto, the strong devour the weak his lurking wish to wreck the religious life of our people and our civic state of law, his ever clearer manifestation as the destroyer of Western culture that he, of all people, pretended to have to safeguard against Bolshevism. But what remained for me as a personal consequence? To fulfill the tasks assigned to me, but beyond that, in so far as I could influence them, to keep my rank and my duty assigned low and my sphere of responsibility small, and not to strive to get ahead. For the higher the position, the more important its support of Hitler, and the more important the support of Hitler, the greater the harm to the German people. To speak to the men as little as possible about Hitler so as not to have to lie too often. To such consequences six years of Hitler could drive one. From the retrospect of 1938 already one could only mourn for Germany. What an insane joke, what a bleak perspective and depressing hopelessness. My leaf flew past. And at the beginning of June I arrived in Hamburg in typical Hamburg weather. Rain, that is. I registered at a hotel and awaited the next day, when I was to report for duty to the commanding officer of the Bismarck, Kapitän zur See Ernst Lindemann. Lindemann's reputation as a naval officer was distinguished. He was known as an outstanding gunnery expert but also as a strict superior and so it was with some nervousness that I anticipated my first encounter with him. Ernst Lindemann was born in Altenkirchen in 1894 and entered the Imperial German Navy on April the 1st of 1913. Because he was not very strong physically, he was accepted only on probation. With the tenacity and energy that already characterized him, 
However, he weathered the hardships of a year of cadet training under a particularly strict officer in the heavy cruiser Hertha, as well as did any of his comrades. Later, one of his classmates who served side by side with him as a naval cadet wrote to me. He said, His zeal and his concept of duty were exemplary. I cannot recall that he ever fell into disfavor or aroused the anger of our cadet officer. When one thinks what trifling misdemeanors could expose the cadets of that period to censure, it becomes obvious that Lindemann had unusual concentration and strength of will. Yet, he was definitely not a careerist in the negative sense. He was an unselfish, helpful and popular human being, wrote the same classmate, who also praised his strict and uncompromising concept of the personal and professional obligations of a naval officer. Nevertheless, he was not lacking in ambition. When in later years Lindemann, who had in the meanwhile become an acknowledged gunnery expert, was told by his classmates that he, Lindemann, would certainly become inspector of naval gunnery someday, he replied, I still hope at least to become commander of the first battleship squadron in the Kriegsmarine. But there was no such squadron again in his lifetime. Lindemann went to the Mervik Naval School in April 1914 and owing to the outbreak of the World War, this assignment had to be broken off and the examination usually given at the end of training was not held. Like his classmates, he was given sea duty and in 1915 was promoted to Leutnant zur See. In the rank list for 1918, he stood fifth among his approximately 210 classmates and later in the Reichsmarine and Kriegsmarine, he ranked second in his class. Most of Lindemann's service was in large combatants on staffs and at the Naval Gunnery School in Kiel. Early in his career, he made gunnery his specialty and he studied every aspect of it. In 1920, as an Oberleutnant zur See, he was posted to the fleet section of the naval staff in Berlin and thereafter to the pre-dreadnought Hannover. By 1925, he had been promoted to Kapitänleutnant and was on the Admiral's staff at the Baltic Sea Naval Station in Kiel. When that tour ended, he went to the second gunnery officer in the pre-dreadnoughts Elsass and later Schleswig-Holstein. Lindemann always performed his duties with the same industry and the same conscientiousness, said the classmate quoted above. For example, as second gunnery officer of the Elsass, he took paperwork home with him, even though that billet in a pre-dreadnought was generally considered a relatively soft job. After a tour as an instructor in the Naval Gunnery School in Kiel, and after being promoted to Corvettenkapitän in 1932, Lindemann became first gunnery officer in the pocket battleship Admiral Scheer. It was at about this time, when more than 20 years of very successful service lie behind him, that he once told some friends that, actually, he was still on probation, because he had never been advised of his final acceptance into the Navy. In 1936 he was assigned as a Fregattenkapitän to the operations section of the naval staff and in 1938 as Kapitän zur See he became chief of the naval training section in the naval high command. This post was followed by one that was a high point in his long and successful career as a gunner, that is, he became commander of the naval gunnery school. Without a doubt, given his specialization in ordnance and his other professional and personal qualities, he was destined to have command of the newest, biggest and most heavily armed German battleship, Bismarck. The appointment reached him in the spring of 1940. The morning after my arrival in Hamburg, Lindemann awaited me in the captain's cabin aboard ship. I appeared, as was usual in such cases, in small service dress, that is, a blue jacket with rank stripes around the cuff and blue trousers. Lindemann, with medium height and build, with sharply chiseled features, stood, similarly dressed, before his desk and looked at me intently with his blue eyes as I announced, Captain Leutnant von Müllenheim reporting aboard for duty, as ordered. I thank you for your report and bid you welcome aboard, he replied with a friendly smile and gave me his hand. My objective, he continued, is to make this beautiful, powerful ship ready for action as rapidly as possible, and I expect your full cooperation. Because of your training in the fire control of heavy guns, your action station will be the aft fire control station as you already know. But that won't be enough to keep you busy before the ship is commissioned and for a while after that, so I've decided to make you my personal adjutant. You've been an adjutant before and also had an interesting tour in London. I was surprised and very pleased to hear that I was to be adjutant. He went on to explain what he expected of me. This duty won't occupy more than your mornings. And in the afternoons, you will be at the disposal of the first gunnery officer, who will tell you just what he wants you to do. This will be your schedule until the maintenance of the combat readiness of the ship requires you to work all day in gunnery. As adjutant, your main job will be to prepare records and reports, supervise correspondence and carry out whatever orders I might issue. 
after a short pause, Lindemann added, One more thing. In the future, I would prefer to hear people on board use the masculine form when speaking of the Bismarck. So powerful a ship as this could only be a he, not a she. I resolved to accede to his wish and although I have had a few slips of the tongue, have done so ever since. Then Lindemann gave me his hand again, wished me well in my new assignment and the interview was at an end. As I closed the door of the cabin behind me, I was certain I had just met a very impressive personality, a man who would carry out his new assignment intelligently and conscientiously. Lindemann's manner was in all respects professional. Being an adjutant was good duty under any circumstances, but in this particular case, it would also lead me into a close working relationship with an obviously ideal commanding officer. August the 24th, 1940. Commissioning day for the Bismarck. Beneath a cloudy sky, a strong chilly wind from the east bank of the Elbe was raising white caps in the river and sweeping over the stern of the ship, whose port side was still made fast to a wharf of the Blomenforce building yard. The sun was not shining, but at least I thought to myself, with the wind coming from that quarter, the ceremony would not be spoiled by rain, and that was something to be thankful for. The crew, in pea jackets and service caps, was lined up three or four deep on either side of the upper deck. From the quarter deck to the forecastle, the officers and senior petty officers wearing their ceremonial daggers and the officers their silver brocade bells as well. The division officers drew up their men along the joints of the deck's planks and reported to the first officer, Fregattenkapitän Hans Oels, that their divisions had been formed. The ship's staff officers stood in a body slightly aft of the starboard gangway, opposite which was the honor guard, with a drummer and a bugler. The fleet band was ready on the quarter deck. Farther forward, under the barrels of the aftmost 38cm turret, representatives of Blom and Foss added a civilian touch to this otherwise thoroughly military scene. Attention! Face to starboard! Barked Oels as a sleek white motorboat bearing the battle ensign and the commission pennant came into view, and the bugler sounded the appropriate signal. All eyes were fixed on the boat, which slowed down and came alongside the gangway. The honor guard presented arms, and the commanding officer was piped aboard by the bosun. Crew formed for commissioning ceremony, reported Oels. Followed by Oels and myself as adjutant, Lindemann reviewed his crew, then mounted a podium on the quarter deck to deliver an address. The men, now standing in ranks 11 to 12 deep, faced their commanding officer and the flagstaff at the stern. Two signal petty officers held the yards taut and were ready to raise the battle ensign. Seamen of the Bismarck, Lindemann began. Commissioning day for our splendid ship has come at last. He called on the crew, on each individual, to do his best to make her a truly effective instrument of war in the shortest possible time and thanked Blom and Foss for having worked so hard that she had been completed ahead of schedule. He spoke of the significance of the hour at hand, which demanded a military solution to the fateful question facing the nation and quoted from one of Prince Otto von Bismarck's speeches to the Reichstag. He said, Policy is not made with speeches, shooting festivals or songs. It is made only by blood and iron. After expressing certainty that the ship would fulfill any mission assigned to her, he gave the command, Hoist flag and pennant. The honor guard again presented arms and, to the strains of the national anthem, the ensign was hoisted on the flagstaff at the stern and the pennant on the mainmast. Both waved smartly in the wind. Battleship Bismarck had joined the Kriegsmarine. Thank you so much for watching. If you're new, welcome. If you're a regular, thank you so much for your continued support. I appreciate you and every one of you. I will see you again in the next video. Until then, like, comment, subscribe. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Cheers.